Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the main stage of Getting Real. We are in day four of the five-day conference and have been so energized and inspired by all that you have been bringing to this gathering. Thank you so much for your ideas, your presence, your energy, your feedback, and your overall brilliance. I'm Maggie Bowman, the Director of Programming for the conference. I am a white woman with long, dark brown hair wearing a floral blouse, and I'm sitting in my living room with a bookshelf behind me. I am um, joining you from Potawatomi Ancestral Land in Chicago, and my pronouns are she and her. Uh, I just have a couple of housekeeping notes before we kick off today's gathering with what I know will be a wonderful conversation on the documentary funding ecosystem. Um, the first note is regarding the networking time, uh, which I hope some of you have been popping in to try out that feature, which is a kind of randomized conversations that last for 15 minutes with someone. And we have some, that's open all the time um, for whenever you wanna go in, but we definitely have some dedicated time for it today from 11.30 to 1.30 p.m. Pacific. And just a note that there are some limitations to this option for our deaf and hard of hearing folks that require ASL to communicate with them. So when you are paired with someone in the app, please be sure to click on networking to the right of your screen in the chat area. If you are paired with someone using ASL, then they will drop a link to a private room where the ASLs are standing by. So please just move over. If, if you see that, join them clicking on that link. And then when you're done with networking there, simply click back over to the networking app for your next session. Thank you for helping make this very cool and fun option in the platform more accessible to all. Another accessibility note is that today's restoration drop-in clinic with Farzana Khan of Healing Justice London, who is our emotional safety partner, um, is happening from 10 to 12 Pacific time. However, please note that the closed captioning will only be available in that session from 10.15 through 11 a.m. due to coverage that the captioners from the National Capturing Institute will be providing in other sessions. So apologize for that, but please note that there will just be captioning for 45 minutes from 10.15 to 11 Pacific time. And finally, I just wanna thank you all for going on this journey with us in this new digital platform. We really ap appreciate your patience and grace as we have hit a few technology bumps over the last few days. As with many things in 2020, we're all learning and adapting as we go along. I like to think about something that one of our partners at Crux Hannah Fenlin said during our moderator training that I found very helpful. When you encounter a technology bump in this platform or anywhere, it's helpful to take a moment, take a deep breath, do a body scan, and then step back into the space. And our team then is here to troubleshoot and support with you, um, support you and troubleshoot with you uh, as we try and work out the kinks. Thank you for your patience. And now I'm going to hand it over to our moderator for this morning's panel, Jessica Devaney. Thank you so much, Maggie. Um, thank you all for joining us today for the documentary funding ecosystem, building a values-based financial strategy. Um, I just wanna remind everyone that we will have captions pinned to the top of the chat on the right-hand corner of your screen and ASL interpretation will be provided for the duration of our conversation. My name is Jessica Devaney. My pronouns are she, her. I'm joining you from the occupied lands of the Lenape and Canarsi peoples. I'm a white cisgender woman uh, with shoulder length brown hair that's a little bit wavy. I'm sitting in a room with bookshelves with books and plants um, behind me. I'm a producer and also the founder of Multitude Films, which is an LGBTQ-led production company that produces films exclusively by and about underrepresented voices. I'm gonna be moderating the panel today and um, I would love to invite the panelists up now to introduce themselves. Chiwe, do you wanna kick it off? 
Sure. Good morning, everyone. My name is Chi Wei Yang. I'm a senior program officer at the Ford Foundation and lead us Just Films work. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm coming from uh, Lenape land. I'm a cisgendered Asian American man. I'm wearing glasses, uh, sort of COVID era shaggy hair. Oh. I'm wearing a teal shirt and a black jacket and sitting against a gray couch, a white wall and a white movie poster. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm, Mar yeah. yep. I'm Marilyn Ness. My pronouns are she, her. I'm joining you from the occupied lands of the Lenape, Muncie, and Wappinger people. I'm a white cisgendered, wo cisgendered woman with chin length wavy brown hair. I'm wearing a black shirt and sitting in a room with bookshelves behind me. I am a producer of films, including Dick Johnson is Dead, which self servingly is dropping on Netflix today. Uh, camera person and becoming. I am also a director of films, including Charm City. And I am co-founder of the, one of the co-founders of the Documentary Producers Alliance, also known as the DPA. And here in my capacity as co-chair of the DPA committee that recently released the guidelines for the documentary waterfall. Great, Marcia, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, Marcia Smith. A, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a cisgendered black woman talking to you from the lands, the occupied lands of the Wampanoag people. I am the president and co-founder of Firelight, which both produces documentary films and has um, several programs through which we hope to support emerging and mid-career filmmakers of color. I'm uh, Caroline Von Kuhn. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I am a, a white cisgender woman with red wavy hair wearing a white shirt with a green gray um, wall behind me. Um, and I'm calling in from Birmingham, Alabama, not my usual location. So I'm looking down to see the occupied territories which are the land of Muskogee and uh, Shawanwaki. And I'm the director of Catalyst at the Sundance Institute, um, a program on, of independent film financing. Great, thank you so much. Um, to take a minute to just frame the conversation, um, rather than allowing market fluctuations driven by commercial interests to dictate our financial strategies, we have a real opportunity to um, build values-based business models that, um, that, that prioritize editorial independence and uh, equity access and representation. And despite a kind of increase and influx of resources into the field, independent documentaries are, are um, especially, especially those by emerging and underrepresented voices are still largely financed incrementally and often insufficiently through a combination of grants and recoupable funds like equity investment. Um, at the same time, there's a, a tension in the funding ecosystem in the wake of a big, a few big ticket sales. And even though these are, are relatively rare, they're raising questions about the extent to which philanthropic dollars are, um, are, are subsidizing the development costs of, of commercial distributors or even offsetting the risk of, of some equity investors. And so in this panel, we're going to look at the opportunities and the obstacles of indie doc financing in a field that really relies on philanthropic support, um, but is increasingly operating in a distribution landscape that's influenced by corporate interests. Um, a point on terminology, when we say filmmakers, we mean directors and producers. And as for other terms, we're going to be defining them as we go. So if we miss something or you need clarification, please go ahead and add it to uh, the chat. And Maggie and uh, others from the IDA team can help uh, clarify. So Marilyn, to, to kick us off and ensure that we're we're operating in this conversation with a shared set of terms. Can you take a couple of minutes to walk us through key types of film financing available for indie docs right now and, and the implications of those in terms of pros and cons from a filmmaker's perspective? Sure. Thanks. The DPA recognized that we needed to have a common understanding when we created the guidelines. So we created a grid that shares the most common financing tools that are emerging or are already commonly used in documentary films. So I think if we can pull up the grid, great. Um, so at a basic level, donors are people who do not expect to receive a financial reward as a result of their contribution to the film, donors and grantors. And investors or recoupable grantors are people who do expect to recoup or receive some sort of financial reward 
for their um, investment or contribution to a film. And in the case of this chart, um, which you can see in the, they'll be posting a link to the guidelines, the documentary waterfall where this lives. The darkened X means that repayment is required um, when a particular threshold is released or that payment, um, a hollow X means it's not always required. Um, and so we wanted to recognize, if we could just bring the chart up once again, really quickly, that cash advances by filmmakers, filmmakers providing their own cash um, is part of the funding landscape. And then to, to show that sometimes grants and investment, if they're recoupable, function similarly um, in the landscape. And I think we're all together trying to get a, a better understanding of where those overlap so that filmmakers could be negotiating and able to um, respond and able to live up to the, the requirements provided by any sources of funding that they receive. Great, thank you so much. Um, Chi Wei, you know, documentary is, is this unusual mix of nonprofit and for-profit activities kind of under the same umbrella. So diving into some of the mm -hmm. dynamics at play here, can you speak from a philanthropic perspective to how um, commercial interests are, are raising questions about the role of, of philanthropy in the landscape? Sure, thanks, Jess. And you know, speaking from a Ford and from a Just Films perspective, and, and I want to note that you know, Just Films is a funder of both documentary film projects as well as organizations and the field infrastructure. And so, a lot of our thinking is is looking at the intersection of both of those sectors and how they are operating together because they do they are very interdependent. So, you know, as commercial possibilities for documentaries continue to grow, the primary concerns that we have are how this affects and destabilizes the larger ecosystem. You know, because the nonprofit doc sector has long been the talent development and incubator for these projects, and and also how it affects individual um, the sustainability of individual filmmakers, because as as I talked about, they're both very important and interconnected. And you know, regarding big ticket sales, I think that you know to the extent that they distort the market and make it harder for other films to be bought and or reinforce a certain class of exclusive makers who are anointed in that realm and or determine who one believes the audience is and what particular films can command those types of types of price tags that is the concern of ours because that can limit the types of projects and filmmakers that um, that we are most interested in supporting um, regarding equity you know i think that we just want to make sure that the deals we're very realistic that projects are very difficult to finance and that it really takes a combination of many different sources to make these things work and, you know and so i think that we're most interested in making sure that the deals are structured in ways that are advantageous for filmmakers and really glad for the work of the dpa that's addressing a lot of this and that, you know, the need to recoup, you know, can influence filmmaking in ways that ad advance damaging narratives, you know, from a social justice perspective, you know, um, you know, we're very concerned about maintaining the ability for filmmakers to push complexity, narrative sovereignty, nuance, new languages. Those are key to, to social change. And often, you know, commercial storytelling conventions, narrative structure, character archetypes, recognizable tropes can actually do more damage than they do to advance the change that filmmakers want to make. And so, you know, allowing filmmakers to be able to maintain those types of, that independence is very important. And so, you know, I think how our funds can help to sort of balm that or ameliorate that is, is of, you know, is, is top of our mind. And then lastly, you know, for in terms of, you know, the streamers, you know, to the degree to, to which they're destabilizing the ecosystem and affecting the ability for, you know, the legacy nonprofit and public media actors to sustain and do their work. That's a concern of ours, you know, as a funder, again, of content and orgs, you know, we want to think about what's best for all. And, you know, sometimes what might be best for a film or may not be the best for the larger ecosystem. So it's really trying to think about how that balance is made. And, you know, and you know, there's a lot of data that needs to be d dug into this, you know, and for example, I know why the Obama struck a deal with Netflix. That makes a lot of sense, but I've always thought, what if they had made a deal with PBS and just brought all that to public media and helped to, for public media to transform itself in, in the continued work that it needs to do? What could that have done? And or and speaking, looking forward to who else is looking to do these times of partnerships. And so that's a kind of interplay. And obviously a stronger public media system gives much more independence and sustainability to our filmmakers too. So we're really interested in the interconnection of all those different forces. Thank you. I appreciate that. And that's that's distilling some really complex points into into a, a really tight um, container. So thank you for that. And and that relates to Marsha, what I want to ask you next, which is what are 
some potential interventions that philanthropic support is poised to make in our field in terms of possibly decentralizing some of these commercial interests um, and influencing sort of what films are valued and made. And I guess to, to put it um, in other words, like how can philanthropic dollars be deployed to support values around access and representation? Um, well, thank you for the question. I'm not sure I'm entirely qualified to answer that question um, since uh, my organization, you know, um, facilitates a relatively small amount of financing, but uh, we do have a lot of observations um, in terms of how, especially emerging BIPOC filmmakers are managing under these difficult circumstances. Um, and the first thing I'd like to say is I think, you know, some of the things that we're observing are all, virtually all of them are, are field-wide problems, um, but that BIPOC filmmakers, particularly emerging ones, are the miners' canary. So that you see in their experience um, the kind of heightened manifestation of problems that are, are really field-wide. Um, and so, like many other things, I think if you solve for that, if you start from the perspective that they are facing, you solve it for the, for the larger field. Um, and I, I think, you know, the biggest thing I'd like, point I'd like to make is that I, I think we, we all kind of take as a given, for some very good reasons, that uh, equity financing in DOCS is here to stay. Um, I think what we have kind of left unsaid is that in, in some cases, if not many cases, that equity financing actually could have been philanthropic financing. That is, um, if you start from the point of view of uh, BIPOC filmmakers who are underrepresented, emerging filmmakers who have a hard time breaking in, the thing they need most is unencumbered money. Um, the system that we have created uh, forces people into a position to have to piecemeal the funding and in many cases um, rely on equity financing, which um, I know, you know, Marilyn is on the panel. I kind of I wish we had some more filmmakers, uh, especially emerging filmmakers who have dealt with um, equity financing and the kind of pros and cons of that to give some texture to that experience. I just wanna keep uh, kind of in the, the front of our minds that um, since we are in a period in which we are trying to imagine and then bring into existence a new way of doing business in our field, we have to kind of question our opening assumptions. You know, and I, I do think that we have not sufficiently examined the impact of the commercial sector on the values that we all are operating with. Uh, I don't think we have adequately examined the assumptions that underlie equity financing and how that increases the tension um, in the field. Uh, so, you know, I guess I'd say that if, if we start from the perspective of the filmmaker um, and his, her, or their needs uh, to finance films and execute their vision, and that's where our starting point, then we may come to different answers to all of these questions. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Uh, you know, I think highlighting the fact that, you know, overall filmmakers seeking independence and particularly underrepresented BIPOC queer um, filmmakers with disabilities who who are often marginalized and don't have access to some of these commercial players it's certainly much um more filmmaker friendly in in those cases and and then i would also argue in, in most cases if we can resource more of our budgets with grants and then we bump into this kind of limitation in the space in terms of the, the access and, and amount of grants available um, for films. And Carolyn, I think that's a, a, a good way to move to um, you now ma managing the Sundance Catalyst community, um, working with investors and donors. Um, I, I think we've heard, we've heard now um, about the, a number of the tensions in the field. And, and I, I'd be really curious for you to share how you see your role in, socializing investors to the best practices and 
and the values um, of, of documentary that are that are largely um, you know founded around a variety of, of social justice um, aims, um, including creative independence. And and in that vein, like how do you talk about return on investment beyond um, financial expectations, but in a in a broader definition? It's a great question, Jess, and I, I agree with everything my colleagues on this panel have, have said to date. I think, I mean, Catalyst in our in our macro goal, goal for Catalyst is that it is comprised of individual investors, individual philanthropists, foundations who do significant work in this space, both in direct support of artists, but also in challenging the conventional ways that films are financed, as well as companies who pre-agree that they are coming in not to take final cut, not to take rights, but really in the spirit of independence. Um, and so that is, that's the demographic of, of investors we're working with. Um, and our obligation is to vet the investors as much as we're vetting the film teams coming through. And so we have a very upfront conversations be conversation before we even invite a new funder to participate in Catalyst to say, I always lead with the risk. Like, this is a very risky, um, you know, funding opportunity, what is your motivation for getting involved in independent film? And so it's really important for us to make sure that the value proposition of film before we even dive into the finances of it is aligned with what Sundance is going to be putting forward. And if we don't have that, then the onus is on the producing team to have to navigate that in a really challenging way that films come together and fall apart and come together many times over as they're being made. Um, so for, for us, we don't our promise to the investor community is that the Catalyst slate of films is gonna be discovery. It's gonna be film teams that we feel like their artistry and creativity and the way they want to put together these films is aligned with the film itself. We don't talk about the, about X percent possibility of recruitment. We don't talk about the financials of it. Um, we do vet the film teams to assess is this producing team you know, really asking the right questions and, and have a strategy to bring in the right funding partners that best serve their goals for the film. Some films come in and, and it makes sense to be deeply philanthropic. Others um, taking equity makes sense for those teams. But our, our funder community is very much in it because they are, and it's interesting, especially the ones who've joined in the last, I say since February, since COVID and the economy crashed, since George Floyd's murder, we've had a lot of new funders coming in worried about who gets to tell stories and who gets paid to tell those stories and ensuring that there are pipelines and access points of funding for the filmmakers who who, who need those who don't want to or have access to the streamers to excuse me to fully finance their films and i think what she we said earlier about it's really dangerous when you cite the one huge sale to a big streamer and then that is perceived as a norm for someone who's new into film financing. So on the investor side of things, we have year round education where we talk through, I mean, you, you've done panels for us. We have every panel that filmmakers are leading at saying, this is how we write our budget. This is how we're asking questions about how to reach an audience. This is what was right for the model of my film. This is how we put it together with multiple partners. So retention of independence for that team to make the film they want to make in the way that they want to make it is is at the core of how we are, are, are um, suggesting to investors they engage with, with the film teams that come through. And I say but inclusive of funders. Um, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so, you know, Marilyn, we like with, with each person's comments, um, we're hitting on this this issue that we have like a, a really long way to go to achieve even basic sustainability in this field. And of course that the cross section of, of who it's harder for hits the same cross sections of the structural inequalities in our society. Um, I wanna take a minute to refer to the 2018 State of the Field Report by Katie Borum Chatu and her team at the Center for Social Media and Impact who um, found that 56% of doc filmmakers made less than $25,000 in income for their last film, and that 22% of those films, so like one in five, um, even make enough revenue to cover unpaid production expenses and, and, and then move into profit. In, in that report, profit is, isn't, is only defined as covering those, those expenses and and crossing a threshold so it could be anything from like a few dollars and and way up to the big sales that we're seeing so for you um 
even even films that appear wildly successful like aren't translating necessarily into money in the hands of filmmakers and it would be helpful if you could pull back um the curtain a little bit to how sales that that seem more favorable either in terms of price point or profile may not mean that filmmakers even see much of their fee or or back end profit participation yeah uh, and it's an important question i mean and as we look at a field where there's just not enough um non-recoupable funding to go around to make films. Increasingly, filmmakers have to look to other sources to help finish the pie. And so where they're turning is to investment financing and or to sales. And this is where we run into a problem. So if a film is financed with recoupable funding and then the DPA guidelines uses an example, roughly a million dollar film that took $500,000 of recoupable financing, um, if you sell that film, the first money off the top goes to sales agents, lawyers, accountants. If you haven't paid for your festival fees and your production budget, there's expenses that need to get paid. If you need to deliver a broadcast cut down or another version, that comes off the top very often. Um, then next, and traditionally, not what the DPA guidelines suggest, next then come the people who need to be recouped, paid back, investors and recoupable grants. And so if you use that model of the 500, of the film that took $500,000 of equity financing, um, your sale will have to clear well more than $500,000 for the filmmakers to even begin to think about participating in any of the net profits, which is way at the bottom of that waterfall. And so now you understand why it is even that big dollar sale film may mean the filmmaker sees very little, if any, of that money other than the fee that they were paid to make the film, which traditionally we have been encouraged to keep smaller so that you have a chance of finishing the film and finishing your financing. So we get caught in a struggle there. And so one of the things the DPA guidelines aims to address, and it was it's radical in its statement, but filmmakers should be paid for their work at every phase of production. And there's a huge amount of work that filmmakers in it, when cash flow is poor, in an effort to kind of put the money on the screen, right? Continue shooting, traveling to your subjects, editing, we tend to not pay ourselves. And so then you get into a situation where people are deferring their fees, budgeted fees that even in the investor agreements or in the funder agreements, everyone has agreed it's a reasonable budget for that film to be made, but the filmmakers push their money to be last so they can keep shooting. So the DPA does argue that in this idea that filmmakers should be paid for their work at every phase of production, that the full budget should be met before anyone begins to recoup from the sale of a film. And so if that means some of the original sale money goes back to completing the budget so filmmakers should can be paid their fees, we argue that is part of responsible investing and financing. Um, the, the other thing is because we took, as, as investment financing came in, we took our cues from fiction financing. Um, the norm there is that deferred fees or what we like to call unpaid budgeted fees, the fees we all agreed we should be paid, those, are, those were traditionally pushed way down in the waterfall structure, the flow of revenue that comes into a project so that after the investor recoups and now some recoupable grantors recoup and after people get their premium, we're finally in a position to consider paying ourselves the fees that we needed to have made that work in the first place. And so the DPA has also argued that the, um, the, the deferred unpaid budgeted fees should be considered an off the top expense. Again, so if the, for, in order for anyone to recoup, those filmmakers need to get their fees. But you need to stipulate that in the agreements that needs to become standardized in the, the funder agreements and investor agreements, because otherwise this is how you wind up with 78% of filmmakers uncompensated for their work. Um, and then the last uh, DPA recommendation that speaks to this specifically is all filmmakers spend a huge amount of time trying to find that non-recoupable funding and grant, which actually puts investors in a good financial position. The, the less money that needs to be recouped, the more likely they will recoup. And so we have argued that the filmmaker work that goes into raising soft money, which is this non-recoupable financing, should actually go towards their percentage of the net profit split. We should participate better for the financial award of our films for having raised more non-recoupable funding. And these, are, these all need to be um, socialized into our funding environment so that filmmaker sustainability um, still leads in, 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 as a priority in creating the work that we'll all create together. 
Which is that that last solution in particular is is really helpful for some of the tensions that we're seeing right now in terms of how it provides one possible solution for ways that philanthropic support can can through the course of production, the sale and through the waterfall continue um, to support priorities of filmmaker sustainability and, and the health of the field. Um, Marcia, to, to your point about, um, you know, grants being highly, highly preferable um, and, and much more beneficial to filmmakers and some um, you know, your, your question about like how it, it, it would be better for the field if, if a lot of the equity that's come into the space has come in as grants. Um, you know, I think it also hits a, it's a tension where some individual or, or institutional investors are thinking about what, um, under what circumstances might recoupment be important for them to build in, um, given the tensions in these fields, the commercial tensions. Um, what do you see as the implications if we're seeing, you know, rather than than more money moving into the non recoupable direction, if we're seeing some of the current grants or non recoupable funding moving in recoupable directions, you know, it might seem like an obvious question, but can you paint a picture for for the implications on on field sustainability of Indie Doc for that? Um, I'm not sure I can paint a picture. Uh, you know, again, I think. Um, you know, I can raise some problems. <laughs> um, and I, I do think it is a genuine problem for foundations. I won't say it's a problem for equity investors, but it's a problem for foundations to um, see their contribution, their donation to a film, the support of a film end up as a commercial property. That is a genuine problem. I, and I think it's one that philanthropy has to figure out how to wrestle with. You know, that said, obviously it's, the, you know, it's, it's not an easy solution and the solution is probably not, well, let's just make our grants recoupable, which is not, not what I hear philanthropy saying, by the way. Um, but I, I think the onus is really on those of us in the field um, and those not-for-profit financers that is the people with the money and therefore the power to affect the rules to, to come up with some creative ways to deal with that. And you know, one of the problems I think is that if, if we try to solve this on a film by film basis, we may not get there. You know, um, I, I was really curious. I think Caroline said, well, some, some film for some films, um, equity investment is good and makes sense. And for other films and other filmmakers, it may not. I'm, I'm curious about what that means. Um, I'd just like to hear you talk about that. And I also am curious about what exactly is it in our current tax laws that make it more um, attractive for a donor to make an equity investment? What is it? And, and can we push back on that in any way? Can Is there a way we can say, actually, it's great you want to be involved in film. Let's talk about the different ways you can do that. But one of the ways you can do that is actually use your philanthropic dollars because many of the equity investors have those. They have different mechanisms at their disposal for being involved with film. Equity investments are the ones that they choose. That's the one that they choose. And I'm just curious about why that is and if there's an opportunity to influence things pushing the other way. That's really, yeah, that's a, that's a really helpful and concrete piece of uh, a place where we might be able to apply pressure. And, and I wanna get to a point around some, some collective organizing possibilities or ways that we can leverage the power that we do have um, in, in light of these commercial interests. Caroline, do you wanna take a minute to speak to how the different goals of different films in terms of distribution and outreach might impact whether uh, grants or equity are, are beneficial. Absolutely, and I think, I think Marcia, your second question is like, it's so crucial. <laughs> I mean, I think for, especially for us seeing both the financial structure of how those with means to fund films are structured, whether they have the family foundation or donor advised fund, or whether they, um, you know, are choosing to do, you know, equity investment. I think, it, yeah, we're seeing on the funder side of things, such different models based on, 
the funders as well, not just tied to the film. But for the for the film question, I mean, for for us, we really encourage the producing team, that the filmmaking team, um, to really be clear of what their goals for the for the film film are. And I think, for instance, for some of the films, our slate this year is shared at three weeks from now. So we're deep in the work with our filmmaking teams. And you know, there's there's some films that do have streamer ambitions for very specific reasons of of audience engagement that serves. Um, the filmmakers' goals, and they are interested in, in equity with the model they've been working with their with their sales team on um, to to get to that kind of higher budget, um, you know, gap that they need that they need to fill. Other film teams, you know, they they want to really push that art artistic risk and not be beholden to um, equity and and that being part of their decision and what distribution model to pursue. So for me, it's really looking at what the distribution landscape is and what the options for the film film is once it's completed that they could be getting into the world and working back from that. I think, you know, we talk so much about financing, but it's it's not void of what that kind of distribution goal is, whether that's the impact campaign, whether that's, you know, the, the critical acclaim that launches a filmmaker's career, whether that's the education and, and community programming tied to the film. So uh, to me, it's really about what the, what the film team's goals are and then therefore what model serves those goals. And I think it's really important or something we very much emphasize for both filmmakers and for investors is to align on those goals, to ensure that when the film teams have that option to decide what route to go, it's not just about the bigger X deal that brings in more money if that's not what serves that film team's goal of how of the audience they want to engage with and how they want to engage with that audience. So um, there's definitely funders in the Catalyst community who sometimes do investment and sometimes do grants. And for some of them, their conversation with the film team is, you know, is this about what are your goals as a film team? And uh, on great frequency, you know, a, a non-recoupable grant is the right direction to go because that aligns, it gives the freedom to the film team, you know, to really push in a lot of ways. So um, it didn't totally answer your question, but that's the kind of thinking that we're seeing from both the film teams and, and the funders. And I, and I think I, I know my fear for many years now is when you cite the big, you know, one year is the knock down the house sale of, you know, those who are doing grants being concerned that they are just supplementing the risk of, of investors who are then recouping and, and getting making money off of this before the film teams, as you know, as, as Marilyn shared, um, even see a penny on these films, let alone a dollar or a couple dollars. And so um, one of our biggest goals is to make sure that everyone, the film teams and the investors, understand the landscape that is ob obviously always shifting and new opportunities are coming up of distribution before they make those decisions together to even fund a film, because that that's, I think, where the most um, challenges arise. And so to be very clear what the, what the philanthropist goal is in serving that film and to be aligned with the film team, I think that's what, what attracts folks to stay in the philanthropic sector in, in funding films. You know, that said, I do hear from a lot of investors saying we don't have the same amount of wealth as other peers of ours who are funding films. So investment is the way that we see if we recoup, that money can then go back into the next film. And so I definitely hear a lot, especially those who are, who are drawn to funding independent films and intentionally doing a program like Catalyst where there is going to be risk. And we're not saying it's a wise investment. We're saying it's a worthy investment. Um, so that's some of the kind of psychology or thinking on the investor side of things that um, that we we lean into. And on on that piece, you know, when we're we're not, it's not often like an either or when we're talking about hybrid financing models. Um, so you know, in in you know, it's, it's thinking about equity caps. You know, I'm curious to hear from you how you see the role of equity caps in the sustainability of filmmakers and also in terms of the health of the field, building on what you were just talking about? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, film teams are really, what we're seeing from film teams is really assessing what do we think we can sell this movie for, you know, a year from now, three years from now, five years from now, it, it's such equity caps, I think, can really range in the methodology of, of how to land at a number when there's going to be so many new variables specific to the film and then specific to the market. It's it's really hard to say this is what we think uh, the value of our film financially in the market is gonna be. So I find equity caps really tricky because of that. Um, from a catalyst perspective, we never suggest one direction or another for a film team. We connect them with, you know, they have producing advisors, they have lawyer advisors, and we connect them with other filmmakers who we think are asking uh, that question of equity cap in a way that is very 
um, in service of, of the films they're making. And so that's kind of just uh, kind of behind the scenes of how we support the filmmakers arriving at what their equity cap is. I think a challenge I see a lot of the times is if the film, if the budget is, um, you know, say it's a 1.6, $1.8 million movie is a slightly bigger budget for at least for the films we see coming through. Um, and, and the equity cap means that there's such a large portion of philanthropy left to raise. How, how are you gonna find that philanthropy? I think that equity caps can be really challenging for film teams when they have a huge amount of philanthropic dollars to bring in and there aren't em enough avenues to bring that in, especially in the US for you know, US-based film teams making American stories. So that's, I think that, that is, that's a challenge of the equity cap that we see both landing on the filmmaking team and on the investors. And that's where, you know, you know, Marilyn and I were talking earlier today of just like, that's so hard, like what, that's even more challenging for the film team that if they're not, you know, have, they have to raise that money to even pay themselves. Like that's a huge issue in our, you know, in our, in our um, field. Um, but one thing we've seen a lot in applications and even those films we selected is filmmakers not having a substantial enough line to pay themselves. Like that is a huge issue, especially in these smaller films. And so that is the one area that Catalyst does step in and say, you, you have to pay yourself and here's the wage at least to start with and go upwards from that. And the investor community, the, the funder community from Catalyst wants you to pay yourself. That's why they're funding films. The creative, you know, it's your intellectual property, it's your labor, it's your years of life, it's your vision that needs to be paid. So, you know, I think I just brought up a lot of issues. Yeah. Into your question. <laughs> so, um, no, and, you know, when it comes to equity caps, it's both like what, what, how might the market like value this film, but also what are our goals for this film? Are we really prior, do we have like public TV money? Are we really prioritizing an educational release? So we're not gonna get like a, some kind of theatrical deal with like a moderate MG. If we did, we would walk away because we really wanna focus on educational. Like you might have like a 50,000 or $100,000 equity cap on a $900,000 film, or it might be like half the budget. It's just such a range based on the goals. And Chi Wei, I, I'd love to pivot to you here in terms of um, roles that philanthropic leaders or, or kind of the community of philanthropy in the field could possibly play in, cre in creating some standards of engagement with commercial entities um, to help preserve the independence and the power of the filmmakers that you're supporting. And, um, you know, I think we're, sometimes we're, there's, there's a, a different levels of our access to information about the history of our field and, and a number of the elements in, in the report that you just released, uh, the, your Beyond Inclusion report helps lift up some of these moments of history in the field. And I'm also thinking about like the time folks came together to organize for ITVS. And it feels like we're at another kind of tension point where we can really be thinking in, in new ways. And I'm just curious what you would have to, to say about that. Sure, yeah. And you know, there's a, a number of conversations in philanthropy around how we can leverage its leadership and influence to help shape these terms of, it, of engagement. And you know maybe just a few sort of broader categories. One is just thinking you know amongst many funders about how to structure grant agreements to be more advantageous for for filmmakers, um, so that these could be a model for best practice for others to, to draft from. And you know in something that that Caroline mentioned earlier, it's you know one idea was how we could you know reinvest net proceeds back into either impact campaigns or future projects from filmmakers. And this that's something that Ford is actively is actively exploring because our, our grants are recoupable. Um, so one structure, you know, the structure of our grant agreements and, and how we sort of like socialize, mm -hmm. socialize that, test it out and socialize it. Um, the second is um, supporting research and publishing, which provides the data and the story that clarifies how money, audience and impact are all shaped in the streaming era and provides a common framework for everyone involved to, to sort of operate from and build best practice from. You know, right now we're supporting the good folks at the Center for Media and Social Impact to do a, a few studies, including, you know, one, the protection of impact rights uh, uh, within streaming contracts. The other is the role of journalism and reporting for greater field accountability. And another one is the demographics of documentary authorship in the streaming era. And I just think that we just need a lot more just research and data that everyone can see very clearly. Because I think the challenge for working collaboratively is just that, you know, to your point, we there's sort of my myopia of the history that's come before, but also a, an unclarity of actually what is happening in the present. Mm -hmm. So I think that as a baseline, and, and then third is, you know, really thinking about how philanthropy can work with 
commercial entities to invest in that broader ecosystem. You know, the, the report that you mentioned beyond inclusion, which is a landscape scan of POC 11 serving um, um, documentary organizations is, you know, intended to, you know, hopefully, you know, inform the philanthropic giving of many different actors, you know, and it's sort of, I hope a roadmap to where the investment needs to go right now. And it's our hope that we can bring not only philanthropy into that, but also a number of commercial folks to invest in that because, you know, the stronger that whole pipeline is, the stronger their talent pool is, you know, and it's a virtuous, mm -hmm. it's a virtuous cycle, you know, and, and I think folks need to recognize that. And I think that we're, we're beginning, it's beginning to be more understood how everything is linked, you know, and that, and, and the, and the sort of codependency of that whole system, but that needs to be much more manifest. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that, and and particularly like like the data and and resourcing the opportunity to take a step back and analyze the field um, rooted in data, whether that's qualitative or quantitative, in order to really make sense of the moment that we're in, because we're uh, we're often just putting one foot in front of the other and really trying to make sense of this as we're going and pivoting from lessons learned. And so that's, that's just critically important. Um, and, and Marilyn, speaking from oh. your, your point of view as a producer, I, I'm sure you have some, you know, concrete ways that you can see how philanthrop like philanthropic can support can address um, challenges that filmmaking teams face as a result of the imbalance of power when we're negotiating with commercial players, whether it's like a veteran producer, like even if it's a veteran producer like yourself, let alone the like, you know, greater disparity of, of imbalance of power when it's when it's more emerging um, or underrepresented, BIPOC, queer, et cetera. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we've been we've been at the DPA and and also just on my own trying to figure out how do we how does this all work when we're cobbling it together and building it as we go? And so I appreciated Chi Wei sort of looking at the wider landscape and saying, you know, what, how do all of these interrelate? And so I know um, early funding for a filmmaker is like often the hardest to attract and the most pivotal, right? That's when the story leaves your grasp if you can't chase it, if you don't have the resources and why filmmakers put themselves in debt and take on credit card debt because without it, the, story, the film won't be. Um, and so I think I know philanthropic, some philanthropic philanthropic funders are looking at that as sort of like they're being taken to the cleaners. They support this research and development, and then the commercial players come in and pick up those films. But there is a way to think that if the filmmakers could have the resources to research and develop the films on themselves, then they have the potential to go to the negotiating table with these commercial entities with more ownership in the project. They brought more to the table. And so they're not at the mercy of a, of a hard negotiation. They instead could say, here's what we've brought. And ownership in the projects is what we're losing. So when we go to commercial players, very often we're giving up ownership of that project. Um, and actually I saw a question come through in the chat. You know, we actually, the DPA don't call it equity investment because equity confers ownership and it's not that equitable sometimes. And so we just are calling it investment financing and we'd like to imagine a world of more equitable equity. Um, but I think um, if we can get ownership to stay with the filmmakers, that is part of the sustainability um, game because what used to be is independent filmmakers would kind of cobble it together and bootstrap their films and make them and they'd own it on the back end and would benefit from the profitability of that film. And they would be able to squeeze more life out of it because the issue continued on or the education continued to be needed. And those funds, while it did good in the world, also came back to the filmmaker. And so if we could get um, philanthropic funders to consider it mission appropriate to help filmmakers retain ownership of the films for their longer term sustainability, I think the trickle down effect of that, of allowing filmmakers to have, um, to still own the thing that is, is, I hate to say it, the product that they can still sell in the world, that allows us to earn a living. Um, and so I'd love for philanthropic funders to start to reimagine their role as helping filmmakers um, retain ownership, which in turn leads to sustainability. Thank you. And, and Marcia, I, I believe you have a, a program kind of similar to this, and I'm curious, you know, how you might reply if someone said that, that in these cases, your, your 
supporting the development of projects that are then sold to a Netflix that you're providing like risk capital for, for Netflix, for example, like what does that idea even mean for, for films and, and filmmakers who wouldn't have had access to those platforms or, or, or the, the same kind of leverage in negotiating these conversations without the runway that, that, that your support um, or similar support would provide. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, we do have, we just this year in the middle of the pandemic launched uh, a development fund for mid-career BIPOC filmmakers that's named after William Greaves, a pioneering African-American filmmaker. Um, and it really is intended to address the problem that we observed um, after 10 years of running a documentary lab. And that is that BIPOC filmmakers, even when they have had a successful film that's won awards, that's screened at big festivals and is considered um, you know, a great piece of work, those filmmakers often still have a hard time getting support to make another one. Um, and that speaks to a systems problem. It speaks to racism that is kind of embedded in the decision-making processes and where those decisions are located. Um, so the Greaves Fund is really an attempt to say, um, you know, to to replace the capital that does not flow to these filmmakers by buyers or distributors or production companies and say, you know, we're going to invest in your next project. Um, and I'm, I shouldn't probably use the word invest since given how we've been using the word investment in this conversation. Um, I hate those terms that are descended from capitalism that kind of enter our general lexicon. But um, it is it is not encumbered money. Uh, we don't consider it a risk because, again, we try to start from the point of view of the filmmaker who cannot get in the door, uh, which is, you know, a field obstacle again. Uh, but, but this, we hope, will give them a calling card to say, okay, here's the project. I've had the support to think it through more. I have the materials. I have the package that, you know, a buyer could look at and say, maybe the light bulb will go off. It, maybe it should have gone off before and it didn't. Um, you know, maybe it's the same person who turned down this idea because they're looking at a filmmaker, you know, that they don't consider capable or worthy of their investment. Um, so we're, you know, we'll see what happens with that. But, but I believe that that is a small way to begin to shift a little bit of the power away from uh, the commercial section of the industry that, you know, perpetually fails to see work by BIPOC filmmakers as marketable, um, as profitable, because that is the yardstick that they look at. I just want to say, just, just endorse uh, what Chiwe is doing about the, the data. I think the lack of data and the lack of transparency around what individual filmmakers' deals look like really hurts us. Mm -hmm. You know, Again, it hurts BIPOC filmmakers especially, but it hurts everybody. Um, so I, I think that's really important. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited that Chiwe is taking that on. I think it's not going to be easy, um, and it's going to take actually you know, some willingness on the part of individual filmmakers to be transparent about what their own deals look like too, um, mm -hmm. uh, as, as a step toward, you know, an industry, but that whose interest it is not in to make that information public. And as, as we all know, that leads to inequitable deals uh, many times. Yeah, yeah, and so many at so many levels. Whether we're talking about the fees we have in indie budgets, the price point we're selling films at, how those films' value is determined, which then then in those cases can determine our fees in the above the line area. Um, right. You know how waterfalls really work in different case studies. If you have a eight hundred thousand dollar sale on a million dollar film, and and you have four hundred thousand dollars of investment, what Really, how does that really shake out at the bottom if you have X amount of unpaid expenses? And we really don't, um, we don't have a shared understanding where we can kind of look at a set of those scenarios and quickly get what that means for our lives and our livelihood. Um, no one does, if I can just interject for a second, yeah. I think we don't have any transparency into um, the, as you said, who's getting paid what, 
Um, and what parts of the train, you know, between making a film and getting it to an audience, you know, where are the intervention points and what, what are the kinds of relationships that go into that? You know, where, what's the role of the sales agents? What's the role of the executive producers? What kind of relationships exist between talent agents and distributors? Which, by the way, all those jobs are even less diverse than the ranks of directors. Okay, so, so I mean, all those things that operate kind of in the shadows and on the basis of personal relationships really work to the disadvantage of the filmmakers. Um, but mm -hmm. it, it's there's no transparency around what those things really are. Yeah, and that creates tension at, at a number of different points in our industry. And and Caroline, I'm I'm interested in individual donors in the Catalyst community who might be executive producing films at high levels of, of grants. And then, you know, a big buyer may come in and and pre-buy or buy alongside a festival premiere at kind of a high level without this lack of transparency to understand what their anchor grant meant for the filmmaking team's sustainability and flexibility, ability to negotiate, you know, terms around that deal um, by maybe going down on a license fee to get some other kind of rights or, or something else like that. Um, it's, it's, it's easy for them to have some feelings maybe about, you know, did I make a mistake? Should I have done this as an investment? How are you talking to uh, these donors who are asking those kind of questions when we don't have this kind of transparency uh, in the industry? It's a great question and it's a huge problem. I mean, I think even before I took the Catalyst job a few years ago, seeing the trend of philanthropists moving into into investment or, you know, kind of people, again, citing those few huge sales that then uh, was perceived as a norm or, or an opportunity for all films. So. Um, the the short answer is um, it's it's a challenge that we talk about internally. I think what, to what Chiwei was saying earlier and, and to what Marsha was saying, it's that part isn't project by project. That is about having these field wide conversations of understanding what is what is the um, what are each of our roles within that at each step of, at each phase of of the filmmaking and in partnership with the other funding partners for coming in. So you know we use the term. I appreciate what you said, Marsha, about not saying you know investing. I know you know it's not using that using the capitalistic terms when it's not actually about the money coming in it's about the um yeah the kind of the, the labor and, and the work going into again capitalistic terms <laughs> going into Ooh. into the film and supporting it so i mean we're we're just focusing on films that are much earlier on in their process one because that's where the need is and so being a sundance pro program it better serve a filmmaking population who doesn't have access to the funding already and doesn't have other avenues to pursue um to move their films forward so um that I think will be helpful this year in, in setting those conversations earlier. So when a grantor comes in, they're very clear what their role is. And that role doesn't just mean the financial, you know, the fi the way that things are, are financed. I think what Chiwei was saying about, you know, funders or actually, sorry, what Marilyn was saying about, you know, that first grant coming in, that that filmmaker couldn't even move forward with that opportunity unless that money came in earlier. Um, we are very pro soft money. One way that we look at it is encouraging filmmakers to, better the terms um, as far as crediting goes um, and communication goes with, with granting. And so uh, we're encouraging when people are figuring out their crediting um, tiers, thanks to DPA's great work on that the last few years or that was published a few years ago, um, really prioritizing the role of grantor in that way. Um, you know, that said, I will be very clear that the, the in investors, and I agree with the idea of not saying equity investors, it is an investment. It's not about, it's not the equity investment. Um, the investors, they're choosing independent films, knowing it's very risky and in an effort to retain the independence for that film team outside of a commercial entity or going into distribution. So I just, you know, I, I do want to just speak on behalf, like, I do want to say that we very much value the role of investor in, in when you think about all the parties that are needed to come into a film to pull off the financing and pull off the film moving forward. So um, it didn't totally answer your question because we talk about it a lot without a like, here's a clear cut way to, you know, have the conversation. But I think, you know, to everyone's point on this call, 
understanding the bigger picture of, of how this works at every step of the way then allows you to make an informed decision of the financial risk you're taking for the funder side of things and understanding as a grantor your significance and your role that doesn't devalue you when fund when funders who are choosing an investment are recouping against a film. So I do think it's really important to understand how your role is contrasting from another um, funder coming in and that that's, that's gonna be what it is. And that's, that's not a bad thing, that's a positive thing. Yeah, I, and if we had a clear cut response, then this panel would be rendered irrelevant and hopefully that will be the case by next year. Um, and, you know, I think, Marilyn, if, if to pivoting from, from what Caroline was just talking about, if, if we're structuring the hybrid financing, meaning a combination of recoupable and non-recoupable funds in a way that centers the filmmaker's needs, um, then in, in these kinds of scenarios, it, it can be that grants and equity or grants and investment are, um, you know, offsetting the risk of the other and, and then mutually ensuring a film's completion and release. And I, I really see um, the DPA guidelines, you know, making a case for this. And it would be great just if you could break down a little bit more um, how, how the guidelines are, are helping to ensure that filmmaker sustainability is centered in hybrid financing models um, while considering various stakeholders' interests and concerns. Yeah, I mean, we, we know that the field cannot continue without all of these financing sources. And so this really was a, an effort to make more transparent things that have long been not transparent. Uh, so everyone's coming to the table with mutual understanding. Filmmakers are, you know, we're doing our part at the DPA to teach one another these terms. So we show up to the table knowledgeable and we're, we're working with different investor consortia and investors themselves who endorsed to, to try to lay bare some of the challenges we face and the ways in which some things in the guidelines help them to not feel taken advantage of for it to be clear what belongs in a budget and what doesn't, what should come off the top and what shouldn't. Um, but I think if we can, um, I loved hearing Chiwe say that Ford is looking at ways to, to make their recruitment beneficial to the filmmakers and increase filmmaker sustainability. And so um, looking at ways where grants could be recouped to either go back to the filmmaker for the for sustainability while they're rolling out a film and or developing their next project is a great idea that that recruitment goes to the filmmaker or that recruitment could go to outreach and impact which is a separate budget you know film often our fees are for making the film itself so what happens when you're trying to birth it into the world that's a new phase and if there's funding secured for that. Filmmakers could put the time and attention into it, which leads to sales, which leads to impact, which leads to the reach we want the films to have. Um, and and another possibility, if 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 recoupable grantors will consider sitting lower in the waterfall, filmmakers do have a chance of recouping some net profits on the films that they make. And the DPA is advocating for the U.S. model where. 50% of the net profits of a film go straight back to the creative team, to the makers for the creative work they did, not as a financial construct. Um, and then hopefully adding in our effort to raise soft money increases that net profit participation. And it, I want to acknowledge it's really hard to get there, um, to get to net profit. So building in sustainability for filmmakers earlier would be helpful. And also a plea that Let's make it clear, again, transparency, so filmmakers aren't spending tons of money and precious time while they're trying to chase these films as they're unfolding, negotiating these unique and very special contracts. If we can get a little more standardization into the field, everyone could refocus their attention on doing the work of repairing the world, you know, and, and, and making the films that shine a light on these things. So those are, those are sort of the DPAs please to, 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 to open our arms to the whole field, that it's gonna take everybody kind of rowing in the same direction to remedy some of these things that have crept up um, because of the piecemeal nature in which we build it in the first place. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Chiwe, I think, you know, and, and just being conscious of time, I think we'll have one more question. We'll see if there's questions coming in, in the Q&A and if not, we can continue here. Um, but you have you have spoken uh, a couple of times in the past around trust-based philanthropy, and um, and I'm curious, you know, what what does this approach offer 
when it comes to um, questions about the relationship between the nonprofit and for-profit interests in our field, and especially in a field where there's like a, you know, unanimous outcry from filmmakers around sustainability and and a need to kind of figure out how to make it work with, with a number of different players. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, with trust-based philanthropy, you know, we're talking about how do we sort of reorient the power dynamics between funders and, and grantees. And, you know, and that involves building a different type of relationship that's based on, you know, mutual collaboration and, and deeper trust. Um, and, you know, and some of the best practices are around, you know, making funding more flexible and longer term, reducing the paperwork and bureaucracy. And, you know, some ways that we've thought more specifically about it with our relationship with filmmakers, for example, is you know putting very few restrictions on the funding of listening to how filmmakers define impact and how their film will do what they want it to do mm -hmm. as opposed to a standard formula for how we assess impact and therefore what would want to be in you know um uh granted to um, and then also of investing in the in the individual as much as the project and taking risks to advance their practice as much as the project you know, and, and that's based on our, our outcomes at Ford of, you know, influencing social discourse, rent inequality, and advancing the careers of, of marginalized filmmakers, which, you know, are not incompatible with commercial success. But I think perhaps look at it from a longer time horizon, you know, and it's in about investing in a, in, a, in a larger ecosystem, you know, in a filmmaker and in the role of documentary to do something, all of which, you know, are useful for commercial outcomes but also, you know, reach these other social outcomes too. You know, and as we've talked about, you know, no one film is, you know, a silver bullet in terms of social change or box office. That rarely happens. You know, more realistically, it's about investing in a system over the long haul and where the returns, whether they're social or economic, accumulate and build, you know? And um, for investors, you know, I think the question is, what would this look like? You know, is it a long-term investment slate, yeah. you know, with, with, with returns to ass to be assessed over a longer time horizon? Is it you know a one-time investment in the next three projects of a particular filmmaker so that they just have a real big runway to just go deep into a particular question? You know, there's, you know, I think the time horizon question and what you're actually investing in, because all these things, you know, if you're an investor, if you're, if you're thinking long-term, you do these strategic things, which builds the system that allows you to have your return over the long run but you have to build it, you know? And I think a lot of people want to come in on the project level and not want to build that thing that allows those projects to actually do what they want it to do. That's, yeah, I really appreciate that analysis and also you coming in at the end with these these ideas too. Um, it's, it's really, it's really come up a few times the importance of, of looking at the ecosystem and a horizon um, and not, not making project by project either deductions or interventions in terms of changing our strategies. Um, I don't see a lot of questions coming in in the Q&A. So Marsha, I'd love to. Um, there are, just there are questions, in, 14, questions 14 questions in questions. the private chat. Oh, great, great. I'm bad at um, you know, <laughs> reading and having a, such an in-depth conversation. So great. Um, OK, great. So there's a question about. Um, how can we align impact with financial return on investment? Um, and, you know, I, I'd like to put that um, both either to Marsha and, and to Caroline, um, if either of you have anything to jump in there with. Caroline, you first. Oh, I was gonna say the same thing. <laughs> um, aligning, yeah, I think, uh, hmm. I'm I'm less qualified in in like the traditional impact space. I just want to acknowledge that uh, from 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 my background. So um, I do defer to others. I'm not just passing the buck to Marshall on this one um, of impact. I, I think um, impact is it can be used very vaguely, and I, I would love to explore it like um, more about kind of goals for a film. And I think that actually it should translate to the fiction space as well. At least that's internally at Sundance how we're talk about impact. So to me, I think more about the filmmakers' goals and audience and game engagement and reach for the film. Um, so again, my answer would be more tied to that and less about um, kind of an, an impact campaign because again, it's not an area in first time as, as qualified in. Yeah, I mean, I think they can definitely be aligned. It depends very much on the distributor 
and what that how that distributor sees impact. Uh, you know, and often if it's a commercial distributor, they see that as a threat, as a potential threat to their revenues, which of course is always uppermost. Um, but you know, if it's a public television distributor. I mean, our experience is that it's very easy to align. Well, I guess you can't say it's aligned with financial uh, impact because there not aren't really <laughs> there's not really a financial gain there. But um, mm -hmm. I think the kind of public television environment is very um, hospitable for filmmakers who want to develop in impact campaigns. You know, I mean that said, of course, no one wants to pit the two. I mean, you know. Any any filmmaker wants to both have impact and be able to make some money. That's mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, just I would just add yeah. if I can that I often when looking for fund funds for projects because you can't rely on our ecosystem alone. I think that's really key. So as we're out there doing the research on the project and figuring out what the film's about, we're also cultivating potential supporters who care about those issues. And so then when you can cultivate, you know, and hopefully you're cultivating them to be non-recoupable, just grantors, but even in the investment space, if your goals are aligned for why the film's mm -hmm. important, hopefully you can find alignment on saying, okay, we want to put some of the first money in into an impact campaign, or we feel like working in this particular space is going to be mutually important. And so a lot of investors, I think, in the documentary space are double bottom line investors where they care about the issue and the film. And so I think the onus on filmmakers to bring these folks into your conversation and get them excited because they care, uh, maybe can find a little more alignment. And then uh, to Marsha's point, P PBS is most definitely the, the most um, beneficial partner that doesn't kind of get in the way. But if Chi Wei and other groups can help us um, pull out those impact rights, then we shouldn't be in contention with our in, with our distribution as being counter to our impact goals. So these are big ideas that require the whole field, but mm -hmm. I don't think they always have to be separate goals. They could they could be they're not mutually exclusive. I agree. Yeah. I'm going to add one quick thing, and though I know we, we're almost out of time. Uh, I totally agree with everything you just said, Marilyn, or both of you. Um, and there was actually a film that went through Catalyst that Caroline Nebraska put through when she was running this program called The Fight. And for that, all of the investors were included by the filmmaking team and by Magnolia, um, Magnolia, who was releasing it, in engaging in the strategy of the release. Like they did a call for all of us where it wasn't just about more money going to something, but it was aligning with the boards they sat on, the communities they were engaged with, other ways to help support the release of this film, to engage with the filmmakers' goals um, tied, to, tied to impact and not just audi audience engagement. So I, I agree, I think the value proposition is aligning that that your funders not about the money back on that, but really about what are the goals of this film and how how can you how can you be utilized to work with us at future points to open up even more possibilities with us. So thank you, Marilyn. Having those conversations all along the way from the beginning, from choosing the partners that we're working with and making sure that we're aligned on different strategies of return so that they see the value of the impact interventions that we're making also as returns on their investment. And we've had cases where we, you know, returned like less than 30% on a film, but had so much traction and impact that those investors were really excited to work with us on future films, or even one re gave a grant to our impact campaign for that film, even though we only returned such a small portion of the initial investment. And so it really, um, I think, comes down to relationship and communication there. Um, okay, so I think we are, um, yeah, was someone jumping in? No, okay. I think we are about at time, uh, or we are actually precisely at time. So just thank you all for a really rich and, and provocative conversation with, with so much for us to continue to collectively chew on. And it's been a real privilege to host this, particularly uh, given you know our own work at, at Multitude and how we see the real runway that philanthropic support provides for emerging underrepresented directors and, and the potential that it has to um, champion both creators and stories that the market may initially deem too, um, too niche or too risky. And because there aren't uh, enough grants in the space at this time, you know, to resource independent film budgets, 
recoupable funds are often necessary to augment our, our grant funding. And, and, and if structured appropriately and in a filmmaker centered way, they can mutually offset the risk of the other to ensure a film's um, completion and achieving of its goals uh, while allowing filmmakers to retain their rights. So, you know, rather than working at cross purposes, grants and investment in, in this kind of, in these kind of structures can work in tandem to really support an independent documentary ecosystem that really centers films directed and crewed up by people of color, LGBTQ folks, filmmakers with disabilities, women, you know, on, on their own terms, um, without tokenizing them and without requiring independent wealth for their success. So um, I just want to thank all of you, Marsha, Caroline, Marilyn, Chile, Thanks for your ongoing partnership in these conversations and your time and energy today. Thank you to the Getting Real um, programming and operations team for making this and this event and all the events this week um, so meaningful. It, it really has meant a lot to be in, communi in community with all of you in this, in this really isolating time. Um, I also wanna thank uh, Andrea Lust and Mara Bassani Santa Maria for the AFL interpretation. Um, and the National Caption Captioning Institute for live captioning. Thank you so much. <laughs>